Having been born in the East, being a Connecticut Yankee, Brown was still part of this migration that was taking place in the early national period with people from New York, New England, moving into the Western Territory and into these new states, the most important of which in the early national period was Ohio. And this had an impact, I'm sure, on the Brown family's anti-slavery sentiments. And Ohio, being the state closest to Kentucky, was a state in which they would have lots of contact with African Americans fleeing bondage. And New Englanders who were moving to Ohio were of two types. They were the type who were, like the Brown family, anti-slavery. And then there were those who felt that slavery was something that should not be talked about because it was divisive. And so just as there were people in the North who were both anti-slavery and quiet about it, as the nation moved west, there were those people who wanted to support emancipated Africans, and then there were those who wanted to keep the issue under the cover. Many of the Ohioans coming from the east were Puritans, and there were those like the Brown family who were anti-slavery, and there were others who were more into the elite element of the Puritan church, such as the Beecher family, who didn't want to talk about slavery. They felt that slavery was something that would divide the churches and certainly divide the nation. Didn't mean that they felt slavery was a good thing. It was something that simply shouldn't be talked about. It was political and it was not in the realm of religion. The Brown family didn't feel that way. They thought that religion and politics were very much embedded in the whole slavery issue. And so you get these two strains who move into the West and are confronted head on with slavery because of the African Americans moving from Kentucky into Ohio. Well, Brown's father, Owen Brown, is anti-slavery and so his first attitude about slavery comes from his father. And his father told the wonderful story of his first experience with an African, and this was an African-born man who became his friend as a little boy, he used to carry him on his back, and how when the man died, he cried like a baby. And this was a story he would tell John Brown as a boy. And John Brown himself had his own story in that regard, and that was because his father was involved in tanning. He drove cattle for his father, when John Brown was about 12 and he was driving cattle to the army during the War of 1812, he was given refuge by a man who owned a slave boy about John Brown's age. And this experience not only brought John Brown face to face with slavery, but it brought him face to face with the enslavement of a boy who was just about his own age. And the two became friends. Brown had to witness not only the brutal treatment of the boy, but a terrible whipping on the part of the owner. And one can imagine the effect that this would have on a 12-year-old boy who sees someone whom he considers a friend being brutalized in this way simply because he was owned by another man and simply because his skin was black. So this is one of the instances on a, uh, the instances of the impact of slavery on a boy who already had been taught that slavery was wrong. And yet in this situation, he comes face to face with it, not only in the sense that it's a wrong, but in the sense that if he internalized this situation, that black boy could have been him. From this early experience, I think we can get the sense that John Brown was a humanist and his religion as well as his social upbringing, had taught him that human beings are just that, regardless of their skin color or their station in life. And this became very important when he dealt with African Americans, not only as he was growing up, but when he became an abolitionist. And it was a kind of humanism that not all abolitionists had. As a matter of fact, most of them didn't, even though they were staunchly anti-slavery, 
they still had reservations about black equality. And I think you can see throughout John Brown's life that he didn't have those kinds of reservations. To him, African Americans were human beings who were being brutalized and whose individual liberties were being taken away from them. Ohio was a frontier state, and it was a free state. It was also a state that had free African Americans as well as African Americans who were fleeing bondage. And so the Brown family, given their anti-slavery attitude, would certainly have come in contact not only with people whom they were helping free bondage, flee bondage, but also African Americans who lived in Ohio. Now, Ohio was one of those states that had black codes. African Americans, even those who were free, had many restrictions similar to the kinds of restrictions that free African Americans had in the South. They couldn't be out after a certain time. They couldn't gather in numbers more than three. They couldn't ride the same conveyances that whites rode. So the African American population in Ohio, even the free African Americans, lived a pros proscripted life. And Brown certainly saw that. At the same time, Africans were welcome in the Brown household uh, on an equal footing. Brown's attitude, his anti-slavery attitude, his staunch abolitionism, that seemed to be something that he had ever since he was able to articulate it, certainly came from what he saw, his experiences, his sense of humanity, and it also came from a very strong religious conviction. And I don't think we can overemphasize that religious conviction. It, had, it came from the way John Brown read his Bible, uh, the way the Bible was taught to John Brown. And it came from those aspects of the Bible which John Brown emphasized, which of course he got from his father, Squire Brown. And that emphasis was an Old Testament emphasis, an emphasis on the importance of freedom, such scriptures as the, the, the scripture that he that stealeth a man should be put to death, obviously the militant nationalism of the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but also the idea of enslaved people fighting their oppressor. So John Brown was a very religious man, not a churchgoer, but very religious nevertheless. Religion permeated American society in the 19th century in a way that it's difficult to imagine in contemporary times. But this was a nation that was founded to a large extent on religious principles, and religious principles guided the Brown family, certainly guided John Brown. And you have to understand American society as a religious society, as a society of many denominations, but spiritual and religious nevertheless. And within the many religious traditions of Protestantism in America, none was more important than Puritanism. And I think it was uh, Julia Ward Howe who called John Brown a Puritan of the Puritans. He took Puritanism very seriously. And out of Puritanism, the idea that uh, God had chosen America for something great came his spirit of anti-slavery, came his sense that God would bring wrath on the nation if they did not do his will, and if they did not deal justly, not only with God, but with their fellow human beings. And so this was part of the American ethos. Now each group interpreted that ethos differently, but it is important to remember uh, and to understand that much of the ethos, the religious ethos of American society in John Brown's era was from this Puritan tradition. Black revolutionaries also played, I think, a very important role in John Brown's assessment of anti-slavery and what was possible as far as ending slavery was concerned. He was an avid reader. He read The Liberator, 
and he read many anti-slavery tracts. He read black newspapers, and in the process of this reading, he came across a tradition of black rebellion. Nat Turner was born the same year as John Brown, 1800. Nat Turner's insurrection in 1831 was the talk of the entire nation. Nat Turner was a messianic figure. Nat Turner was a man who quoted the Old Testament. That was the basis of his rebellion. And then there were other individuals. Gabriel's rebellion occurred in 1800, the year that, I got cut, got to take that back. It wasn't a rebellion, it was a conspiracy. Um, okay. Gabriel's conspiracy occurred in 1800, which was the year of John Brown's birth. And it was written about in the Liberator and the Anti-Slavery Standard subsequently. There was also David Walker, a very important early black nationalist who wrote an appeal to the colored people of the United States in 1829 in which he called for resistance. And he challenged African-American men to be men and to rise up against their oppressors. And of course, there was Henry Highland Garnett, who was a black Presbyterian minister and who at the Black Convention Movement in 1843 called out to the black people to let resistance be your motto. That they had to move away from moral suasion and use their own strong hands to end bondage. So there was a tradition of black resistance that John Brown could feed into to come up with this idea that blacks should fight for their freedom. There was a tradition of black rebellion that John Brown could draw on as well. In 1800, the year he was born, the Gabriel Conspiracy in Virginia had been planned at very, very wide scale planning. And in 1800, the year that John Brown was born, Nat Turner was also born. And Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831, which reverberated all over the country, both in the rise of the abolition movement and in the paranoia in the South had a deep effect on the North as well as the South. And of course, there was the 1829 petition that David Walker wrote in which he called for African Americans to rise up against their oppressors and to end slavery by their own hands. And John Brown's friend, Henry Highland Garnett, who was a Presbyterian minister, had stated in 1843 at the Black Convention that the African Americans should resist bondage by violence. And he coined the phrase, let resistance be your motto. And had it not been for Frederick Douglass, who showed up at that meeting, it's very likely that the Black Convention movement in 1843 would have voted for violence against slavery instead of moral suasion. Nat Turner's 1831 rebellion had a profound effect on the South. For one thing, it occurred in Virginia, and Virginia was not the Deep South. Virginia was a state that was considered a mild form of slavery. Virginia at the time was also contemplating gradual manumission. And Nat Turner's revolt was a revolt headed by a man who did not live on a large plantation, was not brutalized uh, in any real intense sense the way the enslaved people on the large plantations were. He was a man who could read and write. He was fairly acculturated. And his rebellion destroyed any images the South would have of African Americans being fairly well treated, uh, not rebelling. And it really brought home to the South the idea that no enslaved person was content to be a slave, not even one who was given the freedom to preach among his people and the freedom to learn to read and write. That slavery was wrong and that African Americans saw it as a form of oppression no matter what their conditions were. One of the major points of Turner's rebellion as far as whites were concerned in both the North and the South 
was that there was no such thing as a mild form of slavery, that there was no such thing as treating a slave so well that they wouldn't want to rebel. Because Turner was not an enslaved person who lived on a plantation. He was not someone who was worked incessantly. He had some mobility. He could preach among his people. And yet, while he was preaching, he was fomenting this rebellion. And what he had in mind was literally blood curdling. And it demonstrated to the South that their institution was under siege from within. And it demonstrated to the North that slavery was something that African Americans had never accepted. Because that was one of the myths that the Southerners had tried to perpetrate. The slaves were happy, uh, that this was an institution that was uh, more of a school than a system of oppression. And Nat Turner dispelled that image of the South. And it also created a closed system in the South. There would be no more debate over slavery after 1831. Nat Turner was a symbol for John Brown. He was a symbol of what the wrath of God would do to slavery. And it was a symbol that there were African Americans in the South who understood the workings of the Bible in the Old Testament militant sense, just as John Brown did. And it was a symbol that there were black men in the South who were willing to rise up against slavery, that there was leadership in the South. And so it was very much a symbol of a messianic message that African-American men in the South were willing to rise up and fight their oppressors. And so John Brown, if he could get with African-Americans in the South with that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of commitment, then they could create a rebellion. Like many abolitionists who went about their daily occupations, John Brown was involved in the Underground Railroad. And we tend to think of the Underground Railroad as something people did 24 hours a day, and it wasn't like that. John Brown's involvement with the Underground Railroad stretched over a long period of time. And he was involved in it as the Underground Railroad needed him, which was the way the Underground Railroad worked. We tend to think of the Underground Railroad as something that went on all the time, and it didn't, because African Americans could not flee the South all the time. And so, the conductors had to be ready whenever they were needed. And so individuals went about their daily occupations and then were called upon any time of day or night, any time of the year, to help African Americans flee in bondage. And John Brown's role in this endeavor was to feed them, to clothe them, to help them get from one station to another, and sometimes to protect them from physical harm. That made him very important because many of the Underground Railroad conductors were pacifists, and they would do everything except shoot a gun. And sometimes, in order to protect an enslaved person who was fleeing bondage, you had to use a gun. And so John Brown's role in that way was very important to the Underground Railroad. John Brown met many African Americans through his activities on the Underground Railroad, and it helped him form an opinion of African Americans. And it was an opinion not unlike the opinion of much of the leadership uh, among African Americans in the North. And that was that African Americans had a lot to learn. Um, and it was on the basis of his experiences in meeting African Americans through the Underground Railroad that he wrote what, was, what he called Sambo's Mistakes, uh, the mistakes that he felt African Americans were making. In talking to African Americans who were fleeing bondage about their aspirations and their expectations and what they wanted out of freedom, Brown was concerned that there was not enough solidarity, that they needed to look back at the brothers and sisters in bondage and do what they could to help them. That they needed to see freedom as something that was important 
but not as important as making sure that they did what they could to help others get out of that situation. So he developed an attitude that he felt made him closer to African Americans, that he could talk to them about not drinking, not using tobacco, uh, about unity and about strength, uh, that he could talk to them about the importance of using a gun to protect your liberties. And if they were not willing to look beyond their own individual comforts, he would say, and as he said in Sambo's Mistakes, then they were not really looking toward racial uplift. And in a way, what he used the Underground Railroad for was to come up with what he called a theory of uplift. It was very much like the theory of, up, of uplift that people like Garnett had and his friend in Syracuse, Jeremiah Logan. Over the years of working in the Underground Railroad, John Brown came in contact with African Americans fleeing bondage and asked them questions, talked to them, got a sense of their aspirations, their expectations, their hopes, and felt that he knew African Americans well enough to essentially write what he called Sambo's Mistakes, which was John Brown putting himself in the place of a black leader. He was talking to the African American community, specifically the community of, of freed African Americans, and telling them about unity, telling them about what they should do for the community, what they should do for their brothers and sisters who remained in bondage, how they should live, don't drink, don't smoke, go to church, read your Bible, learn to read and write above all, uh, to create a community. This was published in the Ram's Horn, an African-American newspaper. On one level, of course, John Brown being a white man, uh, being uh, someone who, by African-American standards, was certainly more privileged than they were, this was the height of arrogance. How could he, who had never experienced slavery, who had never been hunted, how could he tell them how they should live and what they should aspire to? On the other hand, this was the same kind of paternalism that many black leaders throughout the North had always espoused. The middle class African American leadership were always telling the working and lower class African Americans how they should live, how they should conduct themselves, and usually it was a kind of way of life that was the way white folks lived. So what perhaps John Brown, as well as these African-American leaders were saying was, be more like white America. And maybe black people didn't want to be like white America. So it was a kind of paternalism. There's no question about that. On the other hand, John Brown probably felt that as someone who had internalized the African-American struggle so long and so much that he had a right to say this because he was not saying it out of prejudice. Uh, he was saying it out of concern. John Brown is a Puritan patriarch uh, in, in every sense of the word. And the Puritan patriarchal attitude comes from the Bible, comes from Abraham. So his attitude is that he always knows what's best. He's never been a slave. He's never had to flee bondage. He doesn't know what it's like to be looked upon askance simply because of the color of your skin. And yet he has so identified with the African-American experience and with their oppression that he obliterates that difference. And because he has obliterated it in his own mind, he feels that African-Americans should obliterate it. But they can't. They are who they are and the society sees them a certain way and they have to live with that every day of their lives. And so there is kind of a, a split in the sense that he wants them to see him as they would any other African American leader. And so he feels that he can say these things to them. But at the same time, uh, he is not one of them. And uh, he nevertheless feels that he 
can behave this way. And it's no different from the way he behaves in all situations. He does not want to hear any other side of an issue except his own because he thinks he's right. The African American community, except Brown, certainly the freed African Americans, those who are emancipating themselves, fleeing bondage, accept him. They accept his help. They accept the idea that he has their interests at heart. The leadership, the black leadership, accept him. They are not completely accepting of his ideas about liberation. We know that. We know that they didn't always accept what he said, but they certainly accepted his commitment. They were astounded. They were deeply moved by his commitment, and they never doubted that commitment because with John Brown, there was a sense of egalitarianism. If he thought he was right when he dealt with African Americans, he thought he was right when he dealt with whites. He thought he was right when he dealt with his own sons. That was the personality of John Brown but it did not mitigate his total commitment to black freedom. Douglas had a deep respect for John Brown, a profound respect for John Brown. He had a respect for his commitment, and he had a respect for what he wanted to do for African Americans. But he told Brown that he was walking into a perfect trap. And Brown couldn't see it, or Brown didn't want to see it. But Douglas was never convinced. Even when John Brown spent that month in Rochester working on his plans, and much of that time Douglas wasn't even there, even when he was doing that, even when he met him in Springfield and he told him about his subterranean plan to move into the Alleghenies, Douglas was not convinced. But what he was convinced about was his utter commitment to black freedom. But that didn't translate into going into something that Douglas considered suicide. John Brown knew that Douglas was the most important black leader in the country. And he knew that if he could get Douglas, or he felt that if he could get Douglas on his side, that would give his movement and his plans a kind of legitimacy and that perhaps Douglas could enlist other people. He says at that point, come with me, Douglas. I've got great plans for you, that when I set up this provisional government, you can be the head of it. On the surface, this sounds very seductive, but Douglas is a very reasonable, very practical man, certainly as committed, if not more so, to the struggle uh, as John Brown. But he understands that this is something that cannot work for many reasons, um, probably the most important of which was that it had been done too hastily, and he is not at all committed. And in a way, you get the sense that Douglas wishes he could do it, that Douglas wishes he could just throw aside caution and go as Shields Green does and go with the old man. But he can't do it because he knows it's not gonna work. Douglas must have wanted to go. At least part of him did. Because Douglas himself was a freed man. He had lived in slavery. But on the other hand, perhaps it was because he had lived in slavery that he understood the mind of the enslaved people and how difficult it was to get them to move into rebellion. And as history had shown with other African Americans who had tried to foment rebellion, it took much, much planning, much, much talking with people whom they saw every day. And the enslaved people didn't know John Brown. And they knew their own compatriots, and it was difficult to get them to move. So it may have been because Douglas knew so well what the enslaved people were capable of, how cautious they were, how suspicious they were of white people, that he could see that this was not going to work. On the practical level, of course, there were other major considerations that he tried to get Brown to think about, just in terms of getting into Harper's Ferry and getting out.
not to mention uh, trying to uh, foment resistance among the enslaved people. So Douglas certainly had to have wanted to be a part of this. Douglas was a revolutionary, and he had himself by then said he would welcome the news of an insurrection among the enslaved people. He said this on two occasions before John Brown, uh, but that was in the heat of passion. And he was a practical man. So there had to be some ambivalence on his part. And later on, after the rebellion, and after Brown was executed, and after Douglas had fled to England, he said that, you know, that almost as though he was saying that I didn't have the courage to do it. I didn't have the courage to do what people are accusing me of having done. John Brown wanted to make money. He wanted to have a solvent family. He wanted to be able to not worry about money. And he spent some time trying to put himself in that position. He was never successful at it. He had a huge family, all in all, 19 children, um, which had to be fed and taken care of. So he was torn. He had this higher commitment that was part of him, that was part of his soul. And he had a deep love for his family, for his wife, his wives, uh, because he was married twice, and his children. But all the time, as he was trying to make money, he was thinking about abolition. And it's something he never stopped thinking about. As he became less and less successful, it's almost as though at some point he made up his mind, I'm not going to be a successful businessman. I'm not going to make money. If I make my mark, it's going to be as an abolitionist. And it's as though once he made that decision, then he went at it full force. But it was, it was an incredible thing because he did try to make money. Uh, he tried very hard. And it was as though the way he probably saw it was God is trying to tell me something, that this is not my calling. My calling is to do what I can to end bondage. John Brown makes this vow after the murder of Elijah Lovejoy to fight slavery with everything he's got. Now, on one level, he keeps that vow. He does fight slavery, but he also has a family to take care of. So this is one thing that keeps him occupied and, one might say, uh, interferes with his real commitment. On the other hand, there are so many personal tragedies that enter into his life. The death of Elijah Lovejoy is monumentally important in John Brown's life and in his vow to do whatever he can to end slavery. But it doesn't happen right away. Brown is embroiled in all kinds of legal problems with his tanning business. He's trying to support his family. And this has to come first. He has to take care of his family. He is, after all, a patriarch. There's also the situation of his personal life, the tragedies that take place in his own life, the fact that uh, a number of his children die, and um, he's not sure what he's going to do in this situation. He knows that he has a calling beyond simply taking care of his family and trying to start a business. At the same time, he is a man who takes pride in being a man and in the manhood, which was something that he was always very, very adamant about in his relations with African-American men, is that manhood is very important. And as a man, could he not see after his family? Could he not attempt to provide the best for them? But as a man, and as a man who believed in the Bible and the Declaration of Independence, which he was fond of saying, could he ignore this calling, which he maintained was directly from God. John Brown said, I believe in the Bible and the Declaration of Independence. And his belief in the Declaration of Independence was something he took very seriously, as seriously as he took 
his belief in the Bible. And the words of the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, was part of his creed. And it really framed his attitude toward people of African descent. I think those words meant more to John Brown than they meant to Thomas Jefferson because he took them beyond rhetoric and philosophy. He took them into practical daily living and he took them to North Elba. And in setting up that community, it was the Declaration of Independence that he had in mind. And he wanted it very clear that he saw African Americans as equals. It's important to understand what an anomaly John Brown was during his time as far as his attitude toward people of African descent was concerned. Because John Brown considered himself a complete egalitarian and it was very important for him to practice egalitarianism on every level. This was not America of the 19th century. America of the 19th century was a very racist society, both North and South. African Americans were caricatures of people. They were characterized as buffoons and minstrels. Uh, they were the butt end of jokes in uh, American society. And even the abolitionists, as anti-slavery as they were, the majority of them did not see African Americans as equals. The majority of them, and this was something that African Americans complained about all the time, the majority of the abolitionists were willing to work for the end of slavery in the South, but they were not willing to work to end discrimination in the North. And much of the legal uh, aspect of society in the North uh, was aimed toward African Americans. Very few of them could vote. Uh, they couldn't ride in the same public conveyances with whites. Uh, there was separated seating on steamboats. But these were issues, these were daily issues that African Americans were confronted with that the abolitionists did not want to deal with. Well, John Brown wasn't like that. For him, Practicing egalitarianism was the first step toward ending slavery. And African Americans who came in contact with him knew this immediately. He made it very clear that he saw no difference. And he didn't make this clear by saying it. He made it clear by what he did. When John Brown invites Dana into his home, he invites him in for dinner and there's the family there and uh, he serves them venison. and. One of the things that Dana notices is that the African Americans in North Elba, there's a couple there who are invited to sit down with them. And Dana observes that, first of all, they sit at the table with the white people, with Brown and his family and Dana and his companion. This is never done in American society. And even though Dana himself is an anti-slavery man, he's appalled at this. What's more, Brown introduces the couple as Mr. and Mrs. Not Fanny and Joe, but Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, uh, giving them the respect that you would give to any white person as far as Dana is concerned. And Dana doesn't understand this. He doesn't understand why John Brown would create this situation of perfect egalitarianism between whites and blacks. Now this meeting is the only record we have of the kind of attitude John Brown has on race. We know what he did at Harper's Ferry. We know that he was a friend of Henry Highland Garnett's and Frederick Douglass, but then so was William Lloyd Garrison, so was Wendell Phillips, so were many of the abolitionists. And yet we cannot equate the same kind of egalitarianism that they had or didn't have with what John Brown had because we have this example. And it's a completely chance situation that gives us insight into the kind of man John Brown was and how different 
his attitude toward African Americans was compared to his compatriots in the anti-slavery movement. So Dana gives us the opportunity through this chance meeting to see John Brown on what was probably a daily basis, and it gives us an insight into his attitude toward African Americans and gives us an insight into how different his attitude was toward African Americans, how different it was as compared to someone who had the same political attitude towards slavery as Brown, but yet had a completely different social attitude toward African Americans and whites. And it gives us a sense of, I don't know what else to call it, but the racism of the society, that you can have an abolitionist, you can have two abolitionists who have a completely different social attitude toward the place of African Americans in American society. I mean, the movement has so many layers. Um, John Brown really represents the top echelon of the abolitionist movement in that sense. And I, I think that's just fascinating that this is a movement to end slavery. And yet you've got all these layers um, with John Brown at the top and the Free Soilers at the bottom. And then someone like Richard Henry Dana in between. Uh, and it's only at the higher echelon that you get individuals who are really egalitarians. Um, and the best example, of course, is the Republican Party, which is another story. Dana doesn't know who John Brown is, really, when he runs across uh, his farmhouse. John Brown is an abolitionist. He's a dedicated abolitionist, but he's not in the upper echelon of the abolitionist movement. So he is not what he becomes to us. And to see this experience and this phenomenon to someone like Richard Henry Dana, to see this social meshing um, is really, it's, it's more than absurd, it's horrific to him. And um, it gives us a sense of John Brown and his egalitarianism. It gives us a sense of what the abolitionist movement is and isn't. It is anti-slavery, it isn't uh, egalitarian. And it also gives us a sense of the absolutism of John Brown. He is anti-slavery, he's an abolitionist, he believes in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. If you're equal, you're equal. You sit at the table together, you break bread together, who knows, horror of horrors, you might even marry each other. And that, of course, was the big boogeyman of the 19th century, was the idea, and this was not only in the uh, South, but it was in the North, more so uh, than the South, because in the South it happened. But in the North, uh, it was something that people were tremendously afraid of, that if you break bread with African Americans, the next thing that would happen was you might marry them. Well, this probably wouldn't have bothered John Brown. It would have been the natural course of egalitarianism, that you dispel these differences between human beings. This, of course, would have been a horror to most abolitionists, because this is what they were accused of constantly. When Douglas and John Brown meet, in a way, it probably, to John Brown, conjured up all the images of what an enslaved person could become. Because Douglas, of course, had been born in bondage. And yet, when John Brown and Douglas met, John Brown met a man who was cultured, articulate, had written a narrative, had traveled to England, had moved to Rochester and started a newspaper, was an editor. And Brown, at that time, was a tanner. Uh, and Douglas describes him as not all that impressive except for his eyes. And his eyes haunted Douglas. And then once they talked, Douglas went back to Rochester and he, when he wrote, he put together 
the conversation in the eyes. And he said that this was the most intense man he had ever met and the most committed. Uh, and it was as though there was this mutual attraction between the two. Both of them felt that they were thoroughly committed. I think John Brown saw in Douglas the possibilities uh, for African American men if they could get their freedom. Uh, and D uh, John Brown probably imagined an entire South full of Frederick Douglasses. So there was this sense of possibility, and it probably really encouraged Brown in his ideas. And of course, it was at that point that, that he felt that he could divulge his plans, his long-range plans, to Frederick Douglass, which he did. And it was a, from then on, the two became very close friends. Well, Douglass admired Brown for his abolitionism. His plans, he looked upon askance. And it wasn't so much that he thought they wouldn't work. Um, it was where were the people going to come from? How was it going to be implemented? Where was the money going to come from? All of the practical aspects of getting this plan going, other than just an idea in a head. And by then, by, at that time, Douglas probably thought that Don, John Brown was you know, a little bit off while at the same time admiring what he wanted to do and being incredibly impressed uh, with his firmness and his commitment. He was not impressed with the idea of what this plan uh, could accomplish. Well, Douglas didn't want to come under Brown's domination, uh, under Brown's influence would probably be a better word, but he couldn't help it. Because, and I think this was the case with a lot of people who met Brown, who sort of wondered, you know, is this man for real? Um, at the same time, there was this magnetism. Because of his commitment, because he was extremely articulate, uh, and because Douglas loved his people so much that he wanted them free by any means necessary. Now, as far as Douglas was concerned, the most important way to work for black freedom was political. That was the point he was at when he met John Brown. Before it was moral suasion, now he's political. So he was not enraptured with Doug, with, with he was not enraptured with John Brown's idea, but he was enraptured with the man. And as much as he didn't want to come under John Brown's influence, he did. For one reason, Brown wouldn't leave him alone. Because just like Douglas saw something in Brown, Brown saw even more in Douglas. And so he sent him letters back and forth, and whenever Brown came up with an idea or wanted to expand on his subterranean plan, it was Douglas whom he went to. That's interesting because he met Garnett first. And it was Garnett who, far more than Douglas, espoused the kind of resistance that John Brown was trying to foment. But for Brown, the immediate leader of black people was Frederick Douglass. He, he knew that right away. So he wanted this relationship. And Douglass himself was pulled toward Brown. Douglass couldn't follow John Brown because it was a kind of suicide. It was also, in some ways, kind of a test of leadership. Uh, it would be, Douglas also had a kind of arrogance about him. Uh, Douglas was a leader. And Douglas had a very strong sense of nationalism. I mean, black nationalism. And he also had a very strong sense of responsibility to black people. He took his role as a leader very seriously. He also took his own intelligence very seriously. And part of this pull, this influence that Brown had on Douglas, certainly encouraged him to want to go. But his own mind, his own practical sense, made him know that he couldn't do this, that this was going to fail. Douglas could not go in his own mind. 
because he saw the venture as doomed to failure. And he saw many people dying. Douglas did not want to die. Douglas had a cause to fight for and to live for. And living to fight that cause was more important than dying for it, for Douglas. Now maybe for John Brown, it was more important to die for it. But for Frederick Douglass, his leadership was more important than his death. And so he could not do it. And on the one hand, Douglas afterwards felt bad that he was not there and probably looked upon himself as somewhat of a coward. On the other hand, it probably took as much courage to say, I'm not going to this man whom he admired so much to admit that he couldn't do that. He couldn't make that kind of sacrifice. So that in itself took a kind of courage for Frederick Douglass. You have to ask yourself, how was it that learned men, novelists, clergymen could support John Brown's ideas, could finance it, could provide the guns, and then you could have someone like Frederick Douglass say, I can't go with you, this is suicide. It's kind of hard to explain, but it probably has to do with the times, the fact that the country was for all practical purposes already at war, and the individuals who were supporting Brown like Higginson and Sanborn and Howe, were radical abolitionists and they wanted something to happen, just like John Brown did. Now, they weren't going to go there and do it, but they were willing to support someone who was. And they were far enough removed from John Brown in a way that Frederick Douglass wasn't, so that they could do this, they could support it, they could finance it and hope that it brought a catharsis, which it did, and then there was really individually nothing invested for them. And so, yes, they were radical. They did want to bring the situation to a crisis. And if John Brown was willing to do that, if he was willing to serve that role, then they were willing to finance it. The Secret Six wanted John Brown on that raid. They were willing to support him. They were willing to support him economically, and uh, they were willing to spread the word. They wanted a catharsis, and there were many radicals in the movement who wanted to create a crisis, and John Brown was willing to create that crisis. Now, John Brown also wanted and needed them. He needed them for his messianic purposes. He needed them to finance his effort to create a rebellion. He couldn't do it alone. So there was, in a way, I suppose you could say they were feeding off of each other to create this crisis. John Brown obviously was investing far more. He was investing his life, but he was prepared to do that. And so, Yes, I think in some ways the Secret Six used John Brown to create uh, this crisis, and they would have even taken it further. One cannot say that they were unheroic, because Higginson, for instance, was willing to lead a raid into Virginia to rescue John Brown. That was fairly suicidal itself. But John Brown's attitude was, I serve a better purpose right here in Virginia. So, and actually, of course, they succeeded in what they were doing. In a way, the two, John Brown and the Secret Six, used each other, and of course, what they wanted was a crisis, and it did create that crisis. John Brown's raid on Missouri, in which he brought out 11 enslaved people, probably represented to him what was possible, because it was an African-American enslaved man who went to John Brown and said, will you help me and my family get out of Missouri? And 
John Brown agreed, and they ended up with 11 self-emancipated African-Americans. John Brown conducted them for 2,500 miles all the way to Canada, making numerous stops, sometimes going by horseback, sometimes by wagon, sometimes by railroad. I mean, it was a perfect example of what the Underground Railroad really was. And he did it with a $3,000 price on his head in the dead of winter. They had to get over the Missouri River by crossing it on the ice. But he succeeded in getting those 11 African Americans to Canada. And it was probably one of the most exhilarating moments of his activities uh, as an abolitionist. And it probably, more than anything else, made him realize what was possible and made what we see in terms of Harper's Ferry as suicide, not really suicidal in his eyes. Because on some levels, Harper's Ferry could have turned out quite differently. So after three months of travel with 11 enslaved people all the way from Missouri to Canada, the group finally reached Chatham. And this must have been an incredible moment, exhilarating not only for John Brown, but of course for the African Americans who had trusted him enough to believe that he could take them from Missouri through the North, after the Fugitive Slave Law was in effect, all the way to Canada. And it represented, again, what they could do, what was possible. It represented for the African Americans who were free for the first time, the hope and the commitment of this man who had never seen them before. It represented the trust that they had. And for John Brown, it represented his sense of himself as a deliverer, which is what he really saw himself as. And it probably, more than anything else, inspired him to think that he could do this on a much grander scale. That if these 11 trusted him that much, then surely those in Virginia and Maryland and the other border states where slaves lived would trust him enough. John Brown believes in unity as far as African Americans are concerned, and he certainly works for that unity when he's dealing with free people of color in the North. But he feels that the real struggle, that the real army is going to come from enslaved people. And the enslaved people of Canada, or the formerly enslaved people of Canada, is where he wants that army to start. And because the community at St. Catharines and Chatham had been enslaved, he feels that they, more than anyone else, can understand the importance of what he's doing, the significance of it, the commitment that's involved. So he goes there and hopes that he can rally them to his cause. Also, things are not going all that well for African Americans in Chatham. Uh, there's a lot of racism on the part of the Canadians, and what John Brown is advocating is basically a utopian community, a black utopia in the West, where they don't have to deal with the racism of Canadians, and they can fortify this community, and it can be a self-contained black state. So this is what he's advocating. He's advocating a kind of black nationalism to this formerly enslaved people in Canada. And he's positive that they will accept this. Chatham was a disappointment for Brown. When he organized his meeting to talk about his provisional constitution for this black state in the West, only 34 or 35 individuals showed up. And that, of course, was a disappointment for him. Harriet Tubman was not there. Um, and uh, Douglas was not there. Uh, the people from uh, Boston, the Secret Six, were not there. Nevertheless, he laid out his plan and proceeded. 
uh, on the basis of uh, uh, what he felt was right. The thing that I think John Brown didn't really understand was that the community was a community of African Americans who had been enslaved. They had emancipated themselves at great cost. It took, to get from the South to Canada took a long time. Many of them died on the way. Uh, slavery was an excruciating experience. And yes, in some ways, they had a responsibility to those who were still in bondage. But to ask them to go back and to believe in him as their leader, to create this rebellion, to succeed and move into the West, and then even once they got there, to fortify themselves enough so that they could withstand the onslaught of the United States Army was more than they could comprehend. Uh, and it was too much of a risk for them. And John Brown, again, not, never having been enslaved himself, uh, being a person who saw himself as a messiah on this messianic mission, and being the man he was in the sense that he did have a kind of tunnel vision and in the sense that I am right, which of course goes with being a messiah, he was not willing to entertain this. Probably if some of them had set him down and said, well, we don't think this is going to work because of A, B, C, and D, he would not have listened. And they had a lot of respect for him, and they certainly understood his commitment, but they were not willing to put their lives in the hands of John Brown. Of course, the question that remains is, was John Brown's idea suicidal, as many people thought? On some level, perhaps it wasn't. There was an arsenal there. What would have happened had he been able to get that arsenal? But even more important, what would have happened if he had laid groundwork for his mission? If he had sent people into the communities of Virginia around Harper's Ferry, if he had done what Harriet Tubman had done so well, which was go into a community and gauge the sentiment and see who was willing to go and who was not willing to go, who could be trusted and who couldn't be trusted. If he had done that kind of protracted work before he made his attempt at Harper's Ferry, who knows what could have happened. If he had met someone like Nat Turner, who knows what could have happened. One has to, you can't help but wonder, why Virginia? But on the other hand, Gabriel, his conspiracy was in Virginia. Nat Turner's rebellion was in Virginia. So Virginia was as likely a place as anyone, any other place, perhaps even more so because of the history of Virginia, the history of rebellion in Virginia. But it seems as though where the real failing was, was in the planning and in the fact that John Brown really didn't know the enslaved community of Virginia. The free black community in North Elba was a transplanted community. It was part of Garrett Smith's visionary idea to create sort of a black utopia, to take African Americans who were not doing that well uh, in the city and put them in a place where they could farm and be on their own, not live in the world of segregation, and it was also sort of an experiment. The community was pretty much ostracized from the white uh, farmers. They had nothing to do with them. And John Brown, in asking Smith to allow him to buy this land and live amongst 
the African Americans and teach them how to farm because they were city people and how to live in this very, very hostile environment in terms of its weather, that this was the kind of experiment that John Brown felt uh, would be beneficial. It worked on some level, uh, but it didn't work on others. Uh, first of all, John Brown wasn't there enough. And when he did come, he was certainly very useful. He helped the African Americans build their homes, helped them with farm, and he was very skilled. He was a very good leader. He was very disciplined. And these were skills that he helped the African Americans acquire. However, many of them ended up leaving North Elba and returning to the city because of the environment, uh, because it was an unstable situation. John Brown saw it as, he saw North Elba as his real home. And on some level, he longed to just go to North Elba and work among this community of African Americans. That was not to be. And uh, in some ways, I suppose you would have to say that the experiment itself was a failure uh, for many reasons. I think the most important reason was that it was just not a, a, a hospitable environment, uh, both in terms of the weather, in terms of the attitude of the people, even in terms of the way the land was surveyed because the African Americans were actually cheated out of the best land. If you're going to set up a utopian community, then you don't set it up in North Elba. On some level, you might say that North Elba and the, the community that uh, he helped organize at North Elba was a microcosm of what he hoped to create uh, with this black state, uh, this utopian area where African Americans could be farmers, uh, where they could live in peace and live in harmony. And, you know, in a way he was going to sort of be the patriarch, not the leader. He had envisioned other people as being the leader. It was going to be self-governing. But certainly there was this image of John Brown overseeing everything, just as he was in North Elba. And yes, there's a certain element of paternalism in it. Um, that was the case in North Elba. That was the case with this provisional territory that he was trying to establish in the West. Uh, it is, the, the, in some ways, the ultimate white man do-gooder attitude uh, that John Brown uh, was espousing. His heart was in the right place. John Brown probably becomes far more important at the end of his life and beyond uh, than even Harper's Ferry or Osawatomie, especially for African Americans. The representation of John Brown in the painting where a black woman is holding up her baby for him to kiss is the personification of what John Brown meant to the black community. And what he meant was the ultimate sacrifice. The price of freedom for African Americans has often been death. And John Brown was willing to make that sacrifice, not for himself, but for black freedom. And that painting represents what African Americans actually thought of him. The idea of a black woman holding up her black child to be kissed by a white man represents almost the, the, the fusion of the races in John Brown's life uh, and represents certainly what John Brown tried to do uh, in his life, which was to live it so that uh, there was no difference between black and white. And I think that that's one of the important meanings of that painting, both symbolically and in terms of what the painter was trying to represent. John Brown's death represented many things. It certainly represented the, the Civil War. Uh, it represented the separation in the nation uh, between North and South. It represented the 
willingness on the part of some people to die for a cause. And it represented probably what some people consider the best in America. Going all the way back, because John Brown was of Puritan stock, it represented what many people felt the nation was founded on. The nation was founded on freedom. Now that freedom was supposed to be a universal freedom. It never was. And what John Brown's death meant was that through his dying, through his sacrifice, that this freedom hopefully would be expanded to include people of African descent. And that the expanded meaning of uh, American freedom would come through the death of John Brown. In the final analysis, it was John Brown's life and his sacrifice that transformed the Civil War into a crusade to end slavery, which is not, of course, what it was when it began. But the sacrifice of John Brown, the legacy of John Brown, and the fact that so many people, as a result of his death, were committed to making that a goal of the war, that is, the end of slavery. In a way, his death transformed the nation. And it took a while, you know, it took some working through to realize that the war would mean nothing if slavery didn't end. And so, John, and you can also see it in the words of people as the war moved toward its logical conclusion which was the end of slavery, that the words of John Brown were reformed by many people, including Lincoln himself. Many people adopted the words of John Brown um, as their own. And so um, John Brown's body became the symbol of the war. In some ways, John Brown transformed America. His statement as he was being led to the gallows that the sins of the nation would only be purged with blood really sent a chill through the nation. And many people thought that this was insanity. And even at the beginning of the Civil War, this idea of the war having a direct effect on slavery was not accepted, even by the president, by Lincoln himself. Toward the end of the war, however, you find even people like Lincoln essentially rephrasing John Brown's words. John Brown said that he did not think that the sins of the nation would be purged except by blood. The sins of the nation that he meant was slavery. Lincoln, in his second inaugural in March of 1865, even though he says that he hopes that the scourge of war will quickly pass away if it does not pass away until every drop of blood that the bondman has shed has been absolved, then let the war go on. Now that sounds very much like John Brown, and it's completely different from what Lincoln said at his first inaugural, and certainly quite different from what he said when John Brown was executed. John Brown was most definitely a hero in the eyes of African Americans. He was a hero in the eyes of many people who were involved in the anti-slavery movement. Even the pacifists, the moral suasionists, who did not believe in violence, saw John Brown as a hero because he was willing to die for his convictions, because of the loftiness of his cause. And so they saw him as a hero even though they did not condone what he did and would not have done it themselves. But they felt that the times had created the mood that allowed John Brown to do what he did. And above all, they felt that slavery was so wrong that anything that was done to end it was justified. So he was a hero, and he was certainly a hero to African Americans because he paid a supreme price for their freedom. It was a totally selfless act.
And how could that not be heroic in their eyes? Douglas was very close to Brown before Harper's Ferry. I think he became even closer to him afterwards. Certainly left somewhat of a void in Douglas's heart that he was not there. And probably it made him more committed than ever to end bondage in the United States. Um, it certainly probably made Douglas feel that a white man had made a sacrifice that he as a black man wasn't willing to make on the one hand. On the other hand, it also probably made Douglas feel that this was a cause that was worth dying for. And Douglas was not willing to die for it, but if he didn't die for it, he certainly lived for it. And that was just as important and certainly just as heroic. Suggesting that John Brown was insane gives you a sense of what the nation was like, gives you a sense of how slavery had permeated American society. To think that a man who wanted to end bondage was insane in a country that had fought for its own liberation is in a way in itself insane. John Brown was fighting for the American creed. John Brown was putting into practice the words of Thomas Jefferson, that the tree of liberty should be watered with the blood of tyrants. John Brown was living out the American Revolution in another generation. So to me, there was nothing insane about what John Brown was doing. He was going against the grain, but America had moved so far away from what it was originally founded for that people in the country saw him as insane because they didn't want to come to terms with their own inability to see other people as their equals.